So I want you to know that we're really on time. I actually made time up here. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Julie. Um, our last talk of the morning is from Dr. Lisa Flowers. She is going to talk to us on the ASCCP risk manage risk-based management guidelines and, clin and the clinical application. Dr. Flowers was a immediate past president of the American Society for um, Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. She is a professor of, in the Department of OBGYN at Emory. She has um, just gotten an R018 NIH grant on the oral microbiome and periodontal disease and oral HPV infection among people living with HIV. And she just mentioned in her question the um, U01 grant addressing community home-based education screening services, a strategy to increase cervical cancer control access for HIV positive women in Nigeria who all have phones. <laughs> we learn. <laughs> and oh, and, and the Dr. Woodham connection. So this, Dr. Woodham this morning <laughs> sent me her connections to all the people. So Dr. Flowers, my attending at Emory who showed me all I needed to know about cervical cytology, colposcopy, and leap procedures, and she always had fabulous nails while doing it. <laughs> well, it's really a pleasure to be invited to this meeting. I have actually have enjoyed just the interaction with everyone here, and everyone is so friendly and lovely. So I'll tell you, I definitely when I talked to Champa, I said, you know, I think I'm going to be coming here every year. It's, a, it's just a wonderful meeting. And I appreciate it and, and honored by it. So um, hopefully I imagine this is the tool, correct? Great, fantastic. And that's the pointer. All right, so the changing. It's the box. It's the box. Oh, lovely. I love it because it gets you, you know, to operate both hands at the same time. So I um, have no financial disclosures. Uh, it's already been mentioned, and, and I'm funded by NIH. So what we're going to try to do is describe um, the importance of HIV infection in actually creating um, estimates for the risk of cervical cancer, um, explain the use of risk estimates um, to improve cervical cancer prevention, and also kind of talk about the fundamental um, guidelines for ASCCP in managing uh, women who have abnormal cervical um, pathology and cytology. I know lately it's been um, a constant change for all of you guys as practitioners. It seems like every year we're coming up with something very new. And we are trying to kind of stabilize that by these risk estimates because what, instead of having algorithms that kind of you're reacting to whatever the result of the, um, the, the test, you're actually going to be determining the risk that the patient has for a SIN2 plus disease or high cell disease of the cervix by what their, um, by their current test their HPV status, but also looking at their history, their previous results, and kind of getting an idea of how you're going to tailor and personalize medicine for that patient. So everyone always has a question about the data that we use to try to create all these risk estimates. And essentially, uh, most of the data came from the Kaiser Permanente Northern California cohort, which was over 1.5 million women. But that's not the only place that we've been actually using information to put in these risk estimates. We also have the New Mex Mexico PAP registry, which has over 450,000 um, women that have been included in the study as well. We also have the CDC cervical um, breast and cervical cancer early detection program of well-screened women that are about 200,000 women that were included in these risk estimates, as well as women that are low income and have had rarely a poor screening from the um, CDC breast and cervical cancer program. And then, of course, we have data coming from industry that has also been included into this data set to try to determine what are the, you know, what were these patients' previous results? What are they presenting now as far as their results of their cervical cancer screening? And um, what is their HPV type, as well as um, the grade of the level of cytology to determine that individual's person's risk for immediate SYN3 plus disease or future risk of disease? Um, so this is, again, just looking at all of those different databases, right, and trying to determine, you know, whether the data is consistent among all of these databases or how different are they. Because we've, there's been criticism that the Kaiser Permanente database is a, this is a 
women that have access to care, correct? And so the question has been, um, do we have women within this database that don't have access to care that are, might be more at risk for cervical cancer? And we're always trying to improve that as everything goes on. But what you can see here um, when looking at this, this is looking at um, individuals who had an LCIL pap, and all of these um, comparisons are individuals with um, um, HPV negative. Um, along with their cervical cytology. So LCIL is the first group. Uh, the second group, and the point is not working, just for FYI. The second group is ASCH. The third group is atypical glandular cells. And the last group is high cell. And so these are naturally um, different type of cytologies that based on whether HPV is, is connected to them, um, or the person's risk, what their risk of disease is. And what you should kind of see going across in all of these different populations, it is really clear that patients who have never been screened, rarely screened, um, or we have no unknown information of their screening are the individuals most at risk of developing immediate, oh, you're an angel, thank you so much, um, are the individuals most at risk for developing, great, um, high cell disease. So this, this group right here, which is the rarely screened individuals, um, are always going to be the people that, because of their history, are uh, at risk for immediate um, uh, SYN3 plus disease. So what are the factors that truly put people at risk for precancer of the cervix, pre, you know, precancerous lesions that can lead them to cervical cancer? And many times, you know, we've been always taught to look at all of these different um, factors that might play a role in people's risk for um, cervical cancer in the future. But the reality is the main um, factors that have the most influence is cytology and high-risk HPV. Really, that's the, that's the key to all of this. And so what I'd like you to take home with this is, okay, what was the person's previous um, cervical cancer testing? Did they have it? Do we not know it? Have they been rarely screened? What is their current cytology? What is the grade of it? Is it a high grade PAP or is it a low grade PAP? And then what is their HPV status? Is it positive? And if it's positive, what types is it positive for? And that should kind of personalize how you should predict what is the next step, whether it's repeat cytology in a year, whether it's colposcopy or treatment. And if you keep that in mind, that'll, that'll keep you, you'll probably be guessing uh, exactly what the app would actually tell you because those are the main factors that kind of make our decision making. Now here, as you can see, what the top, this is actually representing um, uh, high cell um, cytology, and this is representing HPV um, 16. So when we look at, again, previous results influence um, current risk for the patient. So if you want to look at, this is kind of describing SYN3 plus immediate risk for current HPV positive ASCUS results. So the patient presents ASCUS positive high risk HPV and you want to determine what their risk for SYN3 plus disease is. So you can see here, if their previous code test was negative, they're under the threshold by which they will have colposcopy. That threshold is 4% risk of immediate SYN3 plus disease. That's the number that's going to get you to colposcopy. And so somebody with a negative code test within the appropriate screening period, which would have been five years, that reassures us that that person unlikely is going to have a lesion that SYN2 plus disease on their cervix. However, if you have no idea of what their previous test was, or they had a previous test and they were positive for high-risk HPV, or they had previous treatment for SYN2 plus disease in the past, th those are critical hist historic pieces of information that's going to let you know that that person is truly at risk for um, immediate SYN3 plus disease and should be evaluated. So I really want to key this, and I talk to my residents, the longer you're affected with HPV, right, time matters, the type of HPV 16 matters. Um, of course, the other patient factors outside of cytology and HPV is very, it's not important when you're trying to um, think about long-term long risk of sensory plus disease. And then, of course, anybody who has consecutive high-risk HPV testing that is positive, that individual needs to be evaluated. So we've been, this is a graph that so many people have seen, and it really just demonstrates the fact that the majority of HPV infections within two to three years will um, resolve. Or what I like to say is by our HPV testing um, that we currently have, we are unable to, to detect that particular HPV subtype. Um, we used to really tell patients and use the word clearance. We don't like to use really the word clearance because it's not that they're clearing the HPV infection. It's just that their immune system is managing it so it's undetectable. 
and we can't, and, and, it's, and it's being controlled. And we know that this is the case because as we've been able to demonstrate reactivation in patients who suddenly later in their life become immunocompromised, either because of um, immunosuppressive drugs, renal transplant, they get lupus, they get cancer, anything that might suppress their immune system, that suddenly HPV gets reactivated. So it is clear then that it's just the fact that the body's immune system has managed to um, keep it suppressed. Um, and so this is really good news to tell patients. I really say, look, in two to three years, most likely I'm not going to be able to detect your HPV infection. If, but however, if they're the, that group of individuals that consistently persist with HPV infection, then those are the individuals that you have to be concerned about, Th that small percentage of individuals that have a chance to develop precancerous lesions or sin 2 plus lesions and then develop cancer um, over time if not treated and evaluated. And one of the things that we have to be clear on that the data has been really um, definitive on is the fact that HPV-based testing is truly going to, um, is the most sensitive test to really identify high cell disease of the cervix. Um, individuals who are using only cytology only, the biggest challenge with this is we have to remember, yes, cytology is a screening test. Yes, cytology has done wonderful things over the years and has reduced cervical cancer um, worldwide. But the challenge is cytology is not in this pathway to cervical carcinogenesis. What is in the pathway of cervical carcinogenesis is high-risk HPV. If you are positive for high-risk HPV, you are at risk for developing cervical cancer in the future. You're at risk. That doesn't mean you're going to get it because so many people are exposed to the virus. However, if you're negative for high-risk HPV, your likelihood of developing cervical cancer or, or a lesion that might put you at risk is very low. And it's because it is the inciting event. It is what's necessary at the beginning to start you on that pathway towards that endpoint. And so it is in the pathway of cervical carcinogenesis. While cervical cytology is just telling you whether cells are abnormal or not and kind of letting you know that this population needs to be evaluated. So when you start to look at here um, how well does cytology work alone, you can see it detects about 50 to 70 percent of precancer, while HPV detects over 90 percent. So clearly, whether it's co-testing or whether it's primary HPV testing alone, um, you actually have a longer interval of protection by using an HPV-based testing than by using cytology alone. You can actually tell the patient that because she's high-risk HPV negative, her likelihood of developing a precancerous lesion on her cervix over a three or five year period of time is low because it's a, it, there's, the fact that she's negative indicates that um, she doesn't have the virus that's going to put her at risk for development of disease, while cytology is not going to provide you that confidence. So the first thing I've already mentioned to you that, you know, HPV testing is critical. It is, um, it refers to whether you use primary HPV testing or whether you um, are doing co-testing, as long as HPV is part of the way, part of the component of your testing strategy for cervical cancer screening that's going to be the best type of screening for the individual. And what's great about it, as I mentioned to you before, knowing the HPV status of the patient is either going to determine whether or not that patient needs to go to COPO, whether they have protection on a long-term basis because they're negative. So again, obviously, I, do, I really like to do this because I stress these points. Um, it's so personalized risk-based management is possible because of current results and past history current results and past history. So when my residents come to Copo Clinic and they talk to me and they're like, well, what is the app going to say? I say, well, what, was her, what, what are her current results and what's her past history? And, and, and that's going to give you an idea. And they, and they start predicting what the app is going to actually um, result in. And then I say, okay, now look at the app. And they're like, oh, I'm right. I say, that's all right. You didn't need the app. Because you have an understanding of what really puts the patient at, I mean, I shouldn't say that. My ACC people will not be very happy with me saying that. But, um, the point is, I think it's critical for us as clinicians because for us to really have an idea without any kind of AI, though I love AI, um, to have an understanding of the fact that a patient's risk, um, that you can actually individualize a patient's risk because you understand the main fundamental issues that are going to put them at risk for cancer. Um, understanding the fact of all these um, risk estimate tables that have been created and are on the, uh, and are on the website. They're all based on all the data from the databases, and they're comp we basically looked at 
all over years of evaluating the patients, what their pap smears were, what their high-risk HPV testing was. And all of that was put in a risk estimate um, uh, um, profile to kind of determine um, and look over time when did they develop Syn3 plus disease and predictive. And, and, and it was allowed us to be predictive of the disease in the future. So um, after being able to use all of these risk tables and get an idea by looking at all these large um, prospective databases and understanding that Syn3 plus disease is the endpoint, we were able to create clinical threshold action thresholds that allowed us to know, okay, based on their risk of Syn3 plus disease, they'll go to COPO, they'll go to treatment, or they'll just have co-testing repeated. And this is just reiterating again the importance of current and past results. And I want to stress this, that really the recommendation for the same results is going to be different for each person because of the fact of the person's history. So if we look here, this is an example um, trying to show you. You have here someone who um, their history is um, HPV negative ASCUS. Um, their current um, um, co-testing is HPV positive and ASCUS. Uh, and because of the fact that they were negative for high-risk HPV in their previous testing that was done during the normal interval, their risk of immediate Syn3 plus disease is 2.1, and their five-year risk is 6.6. .6. So they just need one-year follow-up. Now, um, if you look at um, someone who has, again, a history of HPV negative ASCUS and now is presenting with HPV positive L cell, their immediate risk is 2.6. Um, and their five-year risk is 2.6 as well as having Syn3 plus disease. So their follow-up is one year. And those are individuals that would have undergone colposcopy in the past. So what is truly allowing us to do is people who are at a lower risk because of a history of a negative high-risk HPV within the appropriate time period to um, treat those people less aggressively. And then individuals who have either unknown history or have had history of repetitive um, high-risk HPV testing to be aggress managed more aggressively. So when we look here, you have to ask yourself, is the immediate risk of Syn3 plus disease greater than 4%? If it is, you're going to use the immediate um, risk um, uh, Syn3 plus risk um, component of this um, algorithm. And if their risk is between 4 to 24 percent immediate risk, then COPO is recommended. If they're between 25 to 60 percent immediate Syn3 plus ris risk, then it's expedited treatment or colposcopy can be done. And, uh, and if, there are, um, if their risk is over 60 percent, then expedited treatment would be in their best management. And you say to yourself, well, what kind of an example would be someone that comes into my office and I could immediately do expedited treatment? That's the individual who has a high CILPAP and, ha and is HPV 16 positive. That individual has over a 60% risk of having Syn3 plus disease, and that's someone you could do see and treat and do a leap in the, in the office right on the day of their presentation. Now, let's say, for instance, there, um, when you actually look at their immediate Syn3 plus risk and it's really less than 4%, then you're looking at more of what is their risk for Syn3 plus disease over a five-year period, right? And so if you do that, then if their risk is um, over 0.55%, five-year risk, they return in a year. If they're between 0.15% um, or 0.55%, then it's three years. And then, of course, if their risk is less than 0.15%, then they return back in five years. And that's routine screening for the population. And all of these risk estimates can be found on tables that are present um, in the literature. So um, what are exceptions to these um, thresholds, to these clinical thresholds? Well, an exception is ASK-H. You know, atypical squamous cells cannot rule out high-grade disease. Regardless of the HPV status of individuals with ASK-H, those individuals have a, such a high risk for um, their cancer risk is, for instance, um, if you look at this here, someone with ASK-H HPV positive, their risk of Syn3 plus disease is 26 someone who's HPV negative is 3.4, you say, well, this is quite different, but their risk of cancer is not. And so that's the, the reason why these individuals, regardless of their HPV status, need to have colposcopy. The same thing when you look at HPV 18 uh, individuals who have a normal PAP but are HPV positive, they have a 3% immediate risk of Syn3 plus disease but a high cancer rate. And so that individual needs to go to colposcopy, regardless of the fact that their Syn3 plus disease risk is lower than the threshold of 4%. So this is just indicating that, you know, people who should be managed aggressively, we're starting to do that. Individuals who have a much very low risk, we're starting to be more lenient in their management. And then those with moderate, it has not changed. 
So who would you consider and decide, okay, these are individuals that truly need to be managed more aggressively? Well, individuals with um, high-grade cytology of high cell HPV-16, I already mentioned, see and treat. Someone with high-grade cytology with HPV infection of any type, but who has not had screening in, in over five years, who has not been ha having regular um, cervical cancer screening, that's somebody who's at risk, and that's somebody who should either have immediate treatment or colposcopy um, quickly. Um, and the recommendation is treatment, colposcopy with biopsy is not needed to confirm diagnosis. So typically if I have any patient that presents with high cell positive for 16, or I have a lot of immigrant patients that have a high cell PAP and I have no history, I would just say, let's just do a copo, we see the lesion, treat them right in the office, no need to wait. Now, what about people who are in that moderate risk um, group? Well, that would be somebody whose genotype is um, 16 or 18, even if their cytology is normal. Um, HPV infection is detected on twice, so somebody who's had two screening events and have had were positive for high-risk HPV of any type. And then, of course, anyone with high-grade cytology of ASCH, atypical glandular cells, or high cell. Those are individuals that need colposcopy. Now, um, there are um, patients with ASCUS and LCIL um, with HPV infection that do deserve um, colposcopy, and that will be somebody who we don't have a history of. Um, however, um, well, we've already mentioned individuals who maybe present with ASCUS or LCIL positive high-risk HPV infection who just need co-testing in a year because they had previous testing within the appropriate time period and their high-risk HPV test was negative. But it's in those individuals who have no history or have had a history of positive high-risk HPV on their previous testing that they should go and go colposcopy. Now, what about the lowest patients who don't need copo? Just to reiterate it again, negative cytology with HPV infection for the first time. Someone would ask us or ELSO with a negative high-risk HPV test previously. And then um, someone would ask us an ELSO with HPV infection on two um, circumstances. Um, that, that's someone actually um, that would be different and would need to be considered to have um, COPO. Um, if a patient has always had normal results and the previous test was a negative high-risk HPV, we already discussed that, and whether the patient, now this is the one I have to admit, I think you guys have to use clinical judgment. Whether a patient had an ASCUS or ELSO followed by SIN1 or a negative COPO biopsy in the past year, um, what, Deciding whether or not that person, if they have abnormal cytology again, such as ASCUS positive for high-risk HPV or ELSO positive for high-risk HPV, and decide to say, well, we did a COPO, they had no SIN2 plus disease found in their colposcopy, they had an adequate colposcopy, I, but the guidelines will tell you that you could just do a co-test in a year. I want you guys to tru truly, truly um, make that decision if you're truly sure that you did biopsies of all the acetyl-white lesions and did a endocervical curatage if it was indicated, because you're making an assumption based on your colposcopy that you've truly ruled out SIN2 plus disease on your copo, and that's going to be the determining factor, even despite the patient presenting on her one-year co-testing with um, HPV positivity and low-grade cytology that you're just going to repeat it again. So that's, this is the only one that, you know, this is definitely clear, negative high-risk HPV test before, now they're positive for high-risk HPV with a low-grade cytology, reasonable to repeat their co-testing. However, um, this, you really have to make sure that you did that colposcopy, that you're absolutely sure there's no high-grade disease in the cervix to really to make the decision that you're just gonna repeat co-testing. And I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to repeat the colposcopy in that patient, because I truly believe that our whole job is to make sure that the patient is not at risk for cancer. Um, so an example, um, we've already kind of went through this, but repetition is always very good. So here we have a patient, um, ASCUS positive for high-risk HPV. Their risk of SYN3 plus disease is 4.5. They need COPO. They undergo their COPO, so their result is less than SYN2 plus disease. So their five-year risk um, of SYN3 plus disease is 2.9%. You're gonna do um, repeat um, co-testing in a year. Now, when you do that co-testing in a year, they're ASCUS HPV positive. The immediate SYN3 plus risk is 3.1. So the current management would be one year follow-up. That person would have gone to colposcopy. And that's, that's the hard one that people are having a challenge with because they feel 
they're positive for high risk HPV, there's an ASCUS PAP, I don't want to miss a cancer, but the likelihood of them having one is very low in, because of the fact that they've had colposcopy with no disease found on it that was high grade. Um, and, and that's one of the people, that's one of the reasons this person would just have repeat co-testing. And then their second co-testing, if their co-test is completely negative, then they just need co-testing in three years. If, however, it's abnormal, they need to have colposcopy. So, yes, I'm sorry about this again. We are adding more things this year. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but this is really important because, and this has taken a long time, the people that are really, really involved in this with NCI and AACCP and the CDC, we've been putting in, they've been looking at what other biomarkers can we add to um, the patient's profile to really more individualize the patient's care and to really identify those people who are at a future risk for having SIN2 plus disease and, and cancer. And so right now we're looking at two things that are um, being evaluated. One is dual staining, which is looking at P16 and um, KI67, which is a proliferation marker on cervical cytology and determining whether that can actually facilitate and help us make a decision of whether somebody needs a colposcopy and evaluation. And though we, I cannot talk about all the specifics of it because it's, it's getting ready for publication probably at the end of the year. An example of that would be, for instance, somebody who presents with um, an ASCUS positive high-risk HPV and you do the dual staining and the dual staining is negative. Then that person may just have their testing repeated instead of going to COPO. So all of these things are going to come into play because we know that um, P16 is very important in letting you know whether there's integration of the virus within the genome, and, the, and it's been very much so associated with high cell disease and a risk of high cell disease. Um, the other example would be somebody with a nil and pap who, um, ha who's high-risk HPV positive, and their dual staining comes back negative, then that patient would... Um, have um, just repeat um, evaluation. Or if their dual staining is positive, that patient would go to colposcopy. So these are different examples how dual staining on the cervical cytology is going to start to help us determine whether the person needs colposcopy or retesting in a year. That you will know by the end of the year. HPV extended genotyping is going to take us a little longer. Um, and the reason for that is they're truly trying to get a lot of data and databases and, um, and individuals into the profile and look at what was the risk of SYN3 plus disease in different populations. What we're finding out is obviously, um, as I mentioned there, the current HPV vaccine does not have HPV 35, which has been found in 10% of cervical cancers in sub-Saharan Africa. And unfortunately, you know, we all thought that the HPV vaccine was going to be the equalizer, right? It was going to start to equalize disease among all populations. And, and to tell the truth, it is. It is significantly reducing SYN3 plus disease and SYN2 plus disease among all populations. However, there is, unfortunately, a disparity. And we know that um, currently African-American women have a higher rate of HPV 35 than compared to other groups and lower rates of HPV 16 and 18 compared to all the other groups. And so that puts them at a little bit of a disparity because a lot of the way we manage our, our um, whether we refer patients to colposcopy is, for instance, if somebody has a negative PAP but is positive for HPV 16 and 18, they go to colposcopy. But if you're dealing with a population that already has more of HPV other, like the majority in our population that we have at Grady, you know, we had a large population of patients who have HPV other, but we don't know what those particular subtypes are. And we've been managing those patients based on 16 and 18 going straight forward to colposcopy and really the other having, who have negative cytology having it repeated in a year and having to demonstrate two years of persistence HPV to really go to COPO. So what we're trying to really make a decision about is is it worth doing HPV genotyping to really understand the other types that might be important in putting people at risk for SYN2 plus disease? Not only 35, but 31, which is starting to show up as a, a bit of a problem. And um, trying to make sure that we're not leading to other disparities um, within populations who have the highest risk of mortality from cervical cancer.
So here, this is another study as well that was looked at um, Hispanic women and other women that were within the U.S. and Mexico border. And what they looked at was what was the prevalence of HPV 35 within this population that's predominantly Hispanic. And again, the most common genotype was um, 35. Uh, many of the other types that were present were also non-vaccine genotypes, and this was mainly infection. And the number of genotypes that were present is 2.1 within that population. So we realize that some populations have lower HPV 16 and 18 and have some of the other genotypes. Now, whether those other genotypes are important in the sense of resulting in high-grade disease is a question. And recently there's been a paper that has come out that has has shown that for, for SYN3 plus disease, there does appear to be an importance of 35 in, them, in having um, a risk of having, and as well as some of the other genotypes and having a risk of SYN3 plus disease. So hopefully we'll have better data as we progress. And this is one of the um, abstracts that was presented um, looking at SYN3 disease and, and non-Hispanic whites, 83, 88% non-Hispanic blacks, 82%, Hispanics, 82%, and Asian, 85%. And it was really significant within this group um, that among Synthrys disease, HPV 16 and 18 was lowest among blacks, and they, they definitively had other types that were responsible for um, lesions on the cervix that can put them at risk for cancer. Now, one of the biggest things I really want to stress, I'm sure all of you um, um, are where we do have ASCCP COPAL standards, and we truly try to have um, two sets because we understand that everybody cannot answer every single question and doesn't have a template that addresses all of the different questions we may ask when somebody presents for colposcopy. But there is an abbreviated form. And what we really want to have is standardization by which people do colposcopy. Uh, and the reason for this is it's going to be really important, uh, especially with electronic medical records, people traveling, to really have consistency among all providers who do this kind of procedure. Key thing that's important that you guys need to know is now that we're really backing off of people with low-grade cytologies, and some of those people are just having repeat co-testing in a year, that means that when they actually do come in because of persistence of high-risk HPV, or because now their cytology becomes upgraded to a high-grade cytology, when you do that COPO, it's not about biopsying the worst lesions. It's, a biops it's about biopsying every acetal white lesion every acetal white lesion, because now we're sort of backing off of these individuals. We're not doing copos on young women, 21 to 24, who have asked us or ELSA. We're following them for two years that they demonstrate persistence of those typical cytologic abnormalities. So when they come in, we have to really rule out and make sure they do not have a SYN2 plus lesion. So these individuals deserve two or four biopsies to really make sure especially if they have multiple white lesions on their cervix, to be sure that there's no disease. And an endocervical curatage based on the guidelines that we've just recently come out on who should have at ECC. So it's, it's, it's really critical that I want to make sure that everybody... Now, we're not asking you to do a leap with your biopsy forceps, okay? I have had someone come in and, oh my God, they have five biopsies and six... But I'm like, what? They did the leap. There's not going to be disease here. There's no reason for us to, you know... No, but, you, but if you have multiple lesions, please biopsy them so we can make sure that the individual doesn't have SYN2 plus disease on the cervix. Um, so one of the things I really try to reinforce is that SYN1 does not need treatment. It doesn't need treatment. And I know so, you know, it's hard. We used to, oh God, I just remember the time I was at Grady and we were cryoing them, we were leaping SYN1s all the time. And obviously these patients are just demonstrating a transient infection with HPV. So there's no need to really treat these patients unless their um, biology of the disease changes and they develop a high-grade lesions. No reason to do that. Just observe them. And then for long-term management, though, we are asking these individuals to be watched a lot closer. So for instance, um, they, after they have their colposcopy and they're only demonstrated to have SYN1 disease, they get their co-testing um, in a year after. If their co-test is negative or their primary HPV test is negative, um, they should be followed with HPV testing with or without cytology every three years, at least for 10 years before returning to normal screening. So that's one of the things. We just want a closer follow-up of, of that group of individuals to assure that they won't progress to high-grade disease. 
Now, what about long-term follow-up of individuals after high-grade abnormalities? Now, it's very clear now that SYN3 plus disease needs to be treated. Um, there was a period of time where we decided to group SYN2 and SYN3 in this category of what we call high SIL, right, the last terminology that we decided to use. And it gave flexibility for people who might have had a component of SYN3 plus disease in their cervix to be treated um, with follow-up and colposcopy every six months. It is clear now that we're being much more aggressive with that group. So anyone with SYN3 plus disease should be treated. These are people at risk for development of disease. And the consideration for observing individuals um, with colposcopy and co-testing every six months to see if they resolve their disease are individuals with SYN2 disease, okay? So anybody with high-grade abnormalities um, and they get treatment, Three, they need three negative HPV tests with or without cytology every year for three years, um, followed by um, 25 years of follow-up of having co-testing every three years. And the reason for that is that these individuals who have been treated with high-grade disease are at risk for um, recurrence of disease and therefore need to be followed for 25 years. And all of this is based on the data from the Kaiser Permanente study that showed that these individuals have um, over a 0.15% risk of having SYN3 SIN plus disease in the future and therefore need to be followed every three years for 25 years. And that's even if it goes beyond 65 years of age. So this is kind of showing you a little bit of what we were talking about. Um, patients with high cell disease, um, of course, if you're able to see the squamous columnar junction and the endocervical curatage is negative, you can choose ablative therapy. Typically, I think diagnostic excisional procedures where leap or cone is better. We do leaps in the office all the time. And what's nice about leaps, you truly get the pathology of what was present in the cervix. Um, so either way, of course, if you are unable to see the SCJ or they've had recurrent disease and they're coming back in for a repeat leap or the ECC demonstrates high-grade disease or is ungraded, they need a diagnostic excisional procedure, which could be a leap or cone. Um, the HPV testing should be done at six months. So what we realize, whether it's done at six months and a year, doesn't matter. Um, if the patient shows uh, positivity of high-risk HPV, uh, they're at risk for recurrence of, or persistence of disease and they need to be evaluated. So instead of doing co-testing in a year, which was our previous recommendation, it's um, HPV-based testing in six months. If that's negative, you repeat HPV-based testing annually for two years. If those two are negative, then they can go to every three years for 25 years. So it's almost as if right after a leap, you're following somebody for 30 years, very closely, very um, closely in the beginning of those first five years and then the 25 years every three years. Um, of course, um, if you want to observe individuals with SYN2 plus disease, you can do it with colposcopy and HPV testing every six months for two years. If they ever get less than SYN2 plus disease on their COPO or their um, cy cervical cytology when it's done at the same time of their COPO is less than ASCH on two testing six months apart, then you can go back to co-testing um, surveillance after the last result within a year. So yes, observation of SYN2 can be done. We know that because regression rates in SYN2 plus disease, well, SYN2 rather disease in young women can be as high as 50%, uh, persistence um, 38% and, and progression 15% or so, but there's a high regression rate. And so in young individuals with SYN2 disease, observation can be done, especially fertility is important. But you have to follow these patients closely. I really have a long discussion with the patient. Are you able to come here every six months? Are there things in your lives that are gonna prevent you from coming in? We know how social determinants of health really truly impact our patient populations. And this happens at Emory Clinic. You know, I have patients that they're in school, they're studying, they have a complex life, you know, um, they're managing their whole household as well as working. And the reality is they're not going to be able to come back in six months to have that COPO. So we want to make sure that truly whatever the situation is in that individual's life, that we truly get a good idea of whether they could truly be able to um, um, pre present for their colposcopies every six months. Understandably, if they have SYN2 disease and it persists for two years, they need treatment. So this is, again, stating what is um, the initial intense surveillance of people, um, HPV best testing after treatment, six months, regardless of margin status, after treatment of high then annually for two years. 
Um, and of course, you know, the issue is this, is that 50, you know, 50% 50 of persistent and recurrent precancer was predicted by a positive margin, but 91% was predicted by HPV-based testing. So believe it or not, HPV-based testing, six months after your leap, will let you know if you have persistence much more um, stronger than whether the patient had positive margins or not. Um, so typically, um, in our clinic, we bring the patients back six months for their co-testing. And of course, if they have positive margins or negative margins, you can make that decision whether they need to be re-excised or whether um, you can consider, especially since I use electrocautery and I always, after doing the LEAP, cauterize the borders, many times those patients, if you did a relief, they don't have disease present, right? Or as studies have shown, hysterectomies on some patients who've had a LEAP, there's no residual disease. So I typically will bring that patient back uh, for their co-test in six months, as the algorithm says, and then if they're abnormal, do colposcopy. Now, understandably, if they're a patient that I have concern, are they gonna come back for that colposcopy at that, if that six month co-testing is abnormal? I may do both at the same time, just to make it convenient for the patient. Uh, Long-term surveillance, three consecutive negative HPV tests, we kind of went through this, and um, this is again just indicating the risk threshold that stays elevated and that's why the patients need to be brought in. I wanna stress, 20% of cervical cancers occur in patients older than 65 years of age. 20% of cervical cancers occur in patients over 65 years of age. We can't ignore that. And a lot of that is because either the patient didn't have appropriate exit screening, or the patient's history wasn't well documented, and these were patients that did have treatment in the past or had high-grade lesions. So we need to remember this, that we don't want, we really truly want to have an understanding of the patient's history, what their true results were, that they had negative exit screening before taking them out of screening. Um, now, we, we all know that there are some rare cytologies such as atypical glandular cells and adenocarcinoma in situ, and these categories, regardless of HPV result, need to have colposcopy. So, for instance, somebody with any of those atypical um, glandular cells, um, they need copo and the cervical sampling if they're not pregnant, and the metrial sampling if they're over 35 years of age, no matter whether they have complaints or not or endometrial sampling if they have chronic anovulation, if they are morbidly obese, if um, they have some abnormal uterine bleeding problem, those individuals need to have the EMB even if they're under 35. And then of course, depending on the results, you, the, they, this PAP has such a high association um, with um, cancer in the future, with um, SYN2 plus disease that this, and AIS that this population needs to be followed as if it's a high grade PAP. Now, anybody who presents with atypical endometrial cells, you could do the endometrial sampling in the ECC um, first. And if all of those demonstrate what, what was causing the atypical endometrial cells, such as any hyper, you know, hyper endometrial hyperplasia, then you don't need to do the copo. However, if everything ends up being negative, you should do the colposcopy and um, reassure that there's no disease. So this is just a typical algorithm. Not much has changed from it. Um, if you don't find any high-grade disease, they get a co-test one year or two years. If both are negative, then it's co-test every three years. And um, they get followed for a longer period of time. Of course, any abnormality, they get copo. And if they have atypical glandular cells favor neoplasia, you have got to find the disease on colposcopy. If you don't find the disease on colposcopy, which, whether it's high-grade um, squamous intraepithelial lesion or whether it's an um, adenocarcinoma in situ, then the patient needs a diagnostic excisional procedure. And consideration for cone knife cone or leap cone needs to be done because you need to discover it because that has a rate of 55% of having high cell disease. So this kind of um, cytology. So that patient needs to be evaluated. Um, in the, uh, of course, um, when you do do excisional um, treatment for patients with adenocarcinoma in situ, so for instance, you have somebody who does on pathology have AIS and you do an excisional procedure. Um, those patients who desire fertility, who have negative margins, you can do co-testing in ECC every six months for three years and then annually for two years. You need to understand that people who 
unlike people with carcinoma in site two that you do a um, leaf excision or a cone, those individuals, if they have negative margins, those margins are going to be negative, especially if you do a follow-up ECC afterwards and it's negative. But the problem with adenocarcinoma in situ is that these individuals will have multifocal disease um, and they'll have skip lesions, um, 10 to 15 percent. So what ends up happening is you'll do your um, excisional procedure and your margins may be negative and yet above within the canal they'll have still adenocarcinoma in situ. And so they have these skip lesions, and unfortunately, it, a negative margin doesn't necessarily mean a negative margin with AIS. You're not reassured. These individuals' definitive treatment is a hysterectomy. That's the definitive treatment with anybody with AIS. So the whole point of it is just waiting to, this, to ask the patient, do, do they desire fertility? Do they want more children? Because if they don't want more children, they're done with their childbearing, a hysterectomy will be in their best interest. If they do want fertility, then you need to do very, very close surveillance, more so than anything else because it's pretty intense, which is co-testing an ECC every six months for at least three years, and then annually for two years. So these patients have to be closely watched, and you're just watching them and watching them until they're done with their childbearing, then you're referring them afterwards to get a hysterectomy. And I've had several patients like this that had adenocarcinoma in situ that um, underwent um, uh, facility treatments, had their children, had twins, whatever the case may be. And finally, I said, are we done? Because I had one, she had twins. And I said, okay, great. We're ready for the hysterectomy. No, I want more. How could you want more? I have one child and I'm dying. And, um, you know, I waited till she had her second set of twins. God bless her. And I said, are we done now? And she said, yeah, we're done now. And so um, we've got our schedule for her hysterectomy and I'm just following her now afterwards. So grateful because I just felt like we were sitting on a time bomb. Um, and I knew those twins were keeping her busy. So, you know, her likelihood of being able to follow up as regularly, I, I really was concerned about it. So, um, of course, these patients need really long-term surveillance. So here we have here, this is adopted from the Society of Gynecologic Oncology. The way you follow these patients, you do an excisional procedure. If margins are positive, you need. If their margins are positive, you gotta re-excise them until the margins are negative. That, that's what has to happen. And if you get to a point where you don't have any more cervix, then you have to decide and work with your gynecologist and what's the next step to make sure there's no invasive disease there and should you do a simple hysterectomy or is there concern about invasive disease and much more needs to be done. Um, for um, people who, um, of course, if their margins are negative, hysterectomy is preferred, and I've already mentioned to you the intensive follow-up. However, if they're conservative, um, they want to have conservative management, I've already discussed this follow-up. So um, that's what we do for those with AIS. And this is just reiterating and stressing. Negative margins on a cone-knife cone that was done for AIS, residual AIS on re-excision is 20%. So you cannot rely on negative margins in somebody who's had an excisional procedure for AIS because of um, their risk of having skip lesions. So what about the unsatisfactory cytology? Um, we're not as concerned about people where you don't see the, you know, the squamous cells of the squamous columnar junction represented on the cytology. We're more concerned when you have an unsatisfactory cytology because those cytologies have been linked to cancer so, or a risk for cancer. So of course, if somebody has an unsatisfactory cytology but you don't know their high-risk HPV, um, you need to repeat their cytology within two to four months based on their age-based screening. If their HPV is negative, it doesn't matter. They need to have this done. If their HPV is positive, and you, and, uh, but they have unknown genotype, you still need to repeat the age-based screening um, in two to four months for cytology. However, if you know they're 16 or 18 positive, they go to COPO. And then, of course, if you do their cytology in two to four months, if they're, it's unsatisfactory again, they need to go to COPO. If it's negative, then fine, you manage it based on the guidelines at the time. And if it's abnormal, again, they most likely will need COPO. So what about those benign endometrial cells that you can get in premenopausal patients or in post-hysterectomy patients? Basically, we do nothing. We're not concerned about it. There's no need for any assessment. It's only in the postmenopausal woman who has benign endometrial cells that needs an endometrial biopsy. And patients less than 25, I, I'll tell you this, I, there's no denying that I've had a patient 26, you know, uh, unfortunately she comes in for her first um, cervical cancer screening at age 25. It's a high SOPAP. I do the colposcopy, and her whole cervix is SIN3, right? 
It happens because what, what have we been doing? Watching them until age 21 and then hopefully hoping they come at 21 to get their, to start their cervical cancer screening. Um, but that's the point. We need to really, first of all, stress primary prevention with HPV vaccination. And second of all, we have to make sure that our patients come at age 21 for their screening. Because if they don't, um, then unfortunately, by the time we actually get to identify disease in their cervix, which high-grade lesions start to show up at age 25 and above um, in patient populations, when we've looked at it, we're gonna end up with patients um, that unfortunately, if they come very late for their screening, they're gonna have significant disease, especially if they have had questionable vaccination um, as part of their history. So um, patients less than 25 years of age would ask us a ELSO, you repeat the cytology in a year. If they still have ask us a ELSO, you repeat it again in a year. And if it's negative, they go to routine screening. If it's any way positive, or if they're at any point of their evaluation, they end up having a high grade cytology, they need to have COPO. And um, I, this population is so important to stress to them the need for coming back for evaluation because they feel like they came back, they had abnormal cytology. You're telling them, yes, you just have some minor changes. You just need to come back in a year to repeat that cytology. When you talk to these young people, they figure out, oh, well, my life is complex. I'm doing school. She said my, my changes were just minor. What well, is going to make another difference if I come back in a year or so? You, know, you truly have to tell them that the only reason why we're observing them is because of the fact that we're assuming that the virus is just a transient infection and that we're just predicting that. And, it's, and really, truly, they need to come back to reassure us that either they're going to resolve the infection or if they're going to persist, that we need to evaluate them. Um, of course, there are... Patients that get referred to me that they do, unfortunately, high-risk HPV testing and in individuals less than 25 years of age. If it is a positive, I ignore it and just repeat the cytology. In a year, if it um, is negative, then you could take them back to routine screening, which would be cytology um, in three years. So that's not a problem. Um, of course, if they're uh, patients with ASCH or higher, they need to have colposcopy. Pregnancy is basically the same thresholds we had before. Of course, we all know ECC, EMB, and treatment is unacceptable unless you think there's a cancer, and then you could talk to your GYN oncologist about taking either a wedge piece of uh, uh, cervix um, removal to assure that there's no invasive disease or taking larger biopsies to rule out invasive disease. Um, of course, SYN2 to SYN3 identified a first colposcopy in individuals who are pregnant. If you felt that you were able to see the SCJ and, and you saw the lesion and you're not concerned about microinvasive disease, those individuals, after you have their biopsy-proven disease, can come back postpartum for their repeat colposcopy and then treatment as needed. However, if um, you feel that the lesion on the cervix is questionable and you need to follow them, um, bringing them in um, every 12 um, 24 weeks during their pregnancy to make sure that their lesion doesn't progress to something that becomes invasive can be done. The immunosuppressed population, this is an interesting group because um, I'm, I was involved in the first paper that came out for those women who were not HIV positive but were immunosuppressed because of renal transplant, lupus, or inflammatory bowel disease on immunosuppressive drugs, RA. And what we felt at that time is that those patients should be managed similar to how HIV positive patients were managed. And definitely the, the, the guidelines of screening and everything parallel those who were HIV positive. Now we're noticing that our HIV positive population is doing so well. Many of them, uh, viral load is undetectable. They have great CD4 counts. They are actually doing well to this immunocompromised population. So um, I want to let you know we're working on the paper now. We hope to have it done by the end of the year for our immunocompromised population who are not HIV positive. Their screening is probably going to be a little bit more um, vigilant, more stricter than our HIV positive population. There will be some similarities, but we realize that this population there's been a very difficult, uh, it's very difficult to control the disease. How many of you guys have had renal transplant patients, patients on immunosuppressive drugs, and their HPV-related disease is worse than any HIV-positive patient? I mean, I have trouble controlling it. I'm calling their, their renal physician, you know, their transplant doctors. Can you lower their drugs? Can you do that? And they're like, absolutely not, you know? And so you're dealing with their disease, and it becomes very challenging to manage. So this will come out by the end of the year, hopefully. Uh, of course, 
People living with HIV, we start screening now at 21. No screening before 21 years of age because they're doing so well. Then you continue screen, you know, doing cytology for three years in a row if they're under 30. Um, so year one, year two, year three, if they have three years consecutively that's negative, you do it every three years um, until age 30. At that point, they can do co-testing every three years and you continue screening them. At this point, there's no stopping for that population. There's just a lot of controversy with it, just continue screening them. Of course, if um, they should have referral for colposcopy, if they have ASCAS or HPV or higher, all cytology else or worse, regardless of HPV, should be referred for colposcopy because this is a high-risk group. What about people who've had a hysterectomy? I think it's so critical, and that I'm really gra grateful for electronic medical records because now we have a better idea of why people have had a hysterectomy. Getting sometimes the patients to understand why that happened is, can get to be challenging. So if they had treatment for SIN2-3 um, disease or AIS, HPV-based testing annually times three and then every three years for 25 years, for 25 years. And yes, even though it's not FDA approved, HPV-based testing should be do done even um, with individuals with a vaginal cuff. HPV-based testing is best. Um, anybody with... Um, who um, the only people that were doing vaginal colposcopy is those who have a high-grade vaginal cytology of high cell, ASCH, or atypical glandular cells. So anybody with L cell, ask us. You don't have to necessarily perform colposcopy. And um, and and I know that seems a little bit concerning. Okay. Now, if the patients have, are positive for high-risk HPV, okay, along with that kind of cytology, especially if they're 16 and 18, then what are you going to do? Colposcopy. And since I have a very high-risk population, even my Emory Clinic, um, I have a hard time breaking from this norm. And, and I, I typically do at least one vaginal colposcopy. And then after that, I let the biology of the person's disease tell me how often they need to be surveillanced. So I, I will tell you that I understand that this is a hard one. Um, I truly end up typically maybe doing one on the patient and making sure that they don't have high-grade disease and then being more, more uh, le less aggressive in them in the future. Now, if there's no previous diagnosis of SIN2 plus disease within 25 years or they've completed their 25 surveillance period and have a normal exit screening, which is two negative co-tests or three negative PAP tests within a 10-year period, then screening is not recommended. And you know, people get cytology done over at age 65. And if they do, you know, I don't ignore it. I, I take a look at whether or not they're justified to have a colposcopy. And if they do, they get it done. If um, I find no disease, then I could decide to say this patient doesn't need to be screened anymore. The other thing is vaginal estrogen can be very helpful in those people that have a lot of atrophy. And I end up just giving them back. If they come in for their colposcopy and the vagina looks like the Sahara Desert, I said, no. Here's some estrogen, put it in a vagina. I will see you, you know, in two months, three months, and we'll repeat this copo. So I think that's um, important. So I have some cases after this. So hopefully, are we doing okay for time? Okay, great. So uh, as far as conclusions, you know, the key thing I want you guys to really focus on is the fact that we're trying to focus on the patients most at risk for disease. And the only way you're going to determine that is the person's history, their current test, if it's a high-grade PAP, and what are they positive for? What are the high-risk HPV tests that, um, type that they're positive for? Um, I already mentioned to you, previous um, screening history is important. We're reducing the number of procedures on our low-risk patients. And what's really good about these enduring guidelines is it's a framework designed to account for changes in tests and screening recommendations. Um, I, I already talked to you about genotyping. I talked to you about dual staining. But even there's going to be more stuff on cervical methylation. And as we move on, move on, we're going to learn about different types of biomarkers that are going to be important in predicting patients' disease in the future. These risk estimates, this modeling that's been done by NCI, AACCP, CDC, has the ability to input all of this data and allow us to personalize care uh, or do precision medicine in our patients and make decisions on whether they need COPO and treatment. So why don't we try to do a little bit of some cases and see. So we have a patient that's 40 years of age, uh, HPV positive, high cell um, cytology, no genotyping uh, was done. So they're just high risk HPV positive. 
Patient had cervical cancer screening at a regular interval within the last five years, but the result of that screening is unknown. Okay, so um, you have the app here. You see 30 to 65 years of age. Does the patient have previous screening results? No. Um, so in this patient population, the recommendation would be um, to go ahead and do colposcopy versus treatment. And the reason for that is because of the immediate risk of SYN3 plus disease. You don't know the patient's history. They have a high risk of having SYN3 plus disease. The threshold is between 25 to 60%. So you can talk to the patient about colposcopy or you could talk to them about treating them at that point. Okay, so now what about if you have the same patient Again, the high-risk HPV, um, HPV positive, no genotyping has, has done, and the patient has not had any cervical cancer screening within the last five years. Are you guys gonna do a COPO? So how many of you guys would do a COPO in this patient? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you guys would say, I'll do a COPO, but I might go into expedited treatment? Yeah, and, and, and I love it. I, you guys are like just on it. So here in the app, uh, rarely screen patients, high cell PAP, positive for high-risk HPV, expedited treatment, because this patient has over a 60% risk of having SYN3 plus disease. So this is really uh, allows you to think about things based on what you've learned today. So again, the immediate risk for SYN3 plus disease is 64%. It is over 60% threshold. Expedited treatment is preferred. Okay, so now this patient again is high cell disease, HPV 16 positive has had regular screening, last screening unknown. You guys could probably do this in your sleep. What are you gonna do for this patient? How many of you guys would do copolone? How many would do expedited treatment? You guys are just superstars. I, I don't even know why I'm here. So, <laughs> so here we go. We have uh, 30 to 65 years of age, HPV 16, positive high cell. They have a greater than 60% um, risk. They need to get expedited treatment. And that's how I want to stress for you guys. Their history of whether you know what it is, their current cytology, which is high cell, their HPV type. That will give you alone the understanding of what you need to do. You don't necessarily, you, you can just check with the app just to be sure. Um, so this is the patient's lesion, a dense acetyl white lesion with coarse punctations. So, um, you know, no change patient with histological high cell remains um, the treatment for treatment and patients since we should always be treated and excisional procedure is preferred. Ablation is acceptable if the patient's squamous columnar junction is seen. And this is just going over what we said. So now one of the things I also mentioned again, HPV testing at six and 12 months is sensitive for determining persistence of recurrence disease. So it has a sensitivity of 91%, and I've already discussed the fact with you that positive margins um, do have, uh, there's a risk of, of uh, fourfold of having persistence versus negative margins. But again, um, doing HPV-based testing will let you know whether there's persistence of disease. Okay, so we have a 35-year-old with an ASCUS path positive for high-risk HPV, history of a negative co-test. So a 35-year-old, ASCUS PAP, positive for high-risk HPV, but has a history of a negative TOCO test that was done within the appropriate interval. So how many of you guys would say, uh, I would do a co-test in a year? How many would say coposcopy? How many would say see and treat? Okay, so let's see. We have a 30-year-old uh, filling in the, the area between 30 to 65. Ask this positive high-risk HPV. Prior testing was a negative co-test. And you guys who said co-test in one year is correct. And it's because of that negative uh, 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 co-test done during the appropriate interval that allows you to feel that that individual is protected. So again, the risk is very low. It's less than the threshold for 4% uh, for um, it's really a five-year risk of 3.6%. So it allows you to do um, co-testing in a year. Okay, so you have a 35-year-old with an ASCUS path positive for high-risk HPV with a history of a negative co-test. Um, I already mentioned to you, five-year risk is 3.3, so you're going to return it back in a year. So this is the next patient. 30-year-old G0 presents with a co-test result of ASCH path positive for high-risk HPV with a negative PAP on a previous screening test. 
All right. Jeez, I, I, I love you. I love you. All right. Um, the app, 30 to 65 years of age, ask age positive for high risk HPV, negative prior test. Yeah, COPO treatment, we don't care. The risk is too high because of that ask age pap. I, you know, so it doesn't matter um, that, the, that they had a negative co test before. It's different because they have that ask age pap. So here we got the fact that their risk for immediate sensory plus disease is 26%. And because of that, the person, you could either do COPO or you could do treatment. So of course, the patient opts for um, observation, uh, for COPO rather. The COPO is sin 2 plus disease when those biopsies. And so um, 30, um, it's the same procedure, patient undergoes COPO, sin 2 disease, wants future fertility. So if that patient wants future fertility, they should be followed um, for with colposcopy and HPV testing every six to 12 months. And they can be followed for two years as, um, until they actually have to have treatment if they have persistence. So as long as you are seeing them every six months and if their cytology goes less than ASCH and if their, if their biopsies are less than SIN2 plus disease on the subsequent, two subsequent colposcopies, then you can go back to co-testing in a year. And I know it says here 25 years of age, but I want to tell you, I was 40 before I had my first child. If I had SIN2 plus disease, nobody was doing a leap on my cervix. So we have to remember that, why don't we just say um, women who have yet to have children? <laughs> You know, because we have to keep that in consideration that our, our population here in the United States, we typically delay our childbearing. And so we have to be considerate of that. Here we have, again, this is just showing you what should be done. If you see the SCJ, you can do, if the patient wants treatment, you can do a diagnostic excisional procedure or ablation. However, if there's any concern about a lesion in the canal, a positive ECC, or the SCJ not being seen, they should have an excisional procedure and then HPV-based testing. So it just follows suit. All right, this one is a G0, presents with a co-test, result of ASCH, positive high-risk HPV, negative PAP on previous screening tests, I already told you that, and the risk was 26%. So um, expedited or colposcopy can be done. Um, future pregnancy was desired, so that person gets HPV testing and colposcopy every six months. Anyone with a histological SIN3 needs to get treated. If future pregnancy is not, desi not desired, then expedite treatment with no COPO or COPO after histology results can be done. We got a 40-year-old presents with a cold test of vanillin PAP positive for high-risk HPV other and a history of vanillin PAP positive for high-risk HPV other. Mm, I love it. 30 to 65 years of age, positive HPV, normal PAP, um, previous history, pos um, negative, what is the can I say? Positive, <laughs> nilum pap uh, previously. And so you guys, how many of you guys say co-testing in a year? So that has nilum pap, negative, um, what did I say? Uh, oh, sorry, 40 year old presents with co-testing result of nilum pap positive high risk HPV other and history of nilum pap positive high risk HPV other. So, Co-testing one year, no one's raising their hands. Coposcopy, copo at treatment, treatment. Why is it not? B and C, it, not really, not really, because this patient's risk is immediate symptom versus 4.1. I would not necessarily do a C and treat. I would, I would just do a COPO and wait till the histological results come in and make a decision. Span. All right. so you, see, the G1 oncologists, they want to remove the cervix. They would have everything removed if it was up to them. So um, you guys are just rock stars. And why is the persistence of high-risk HPV? So that's just, that's just taking those principles that we talked about. So let's say her pro, the prior test was ASCUS PAP negative for high-risk HPV. So what do we mean by that? Um, um, the person is presenting with a um, normal PAP, nilum PAP, HPV positive. They previously had in their prior testing a negative high-risk HPV with an ASCUS PAP. 
Now what do you guys, how many of you guys say co-testing in a year? Okay, how many says COPO? Co COPO treatment, treatment. See, you guys are rock star. Co-testing in a year because of that negative high-risk HPV. So that's why I said when I do this with my residents, they figure it out and they don't have, they'll go to the app because they want to know if they're right. You know how residents are. They have to know they're right. Um, but they realize it because of the fact that um, all you have to know is those principles. So um, that's the risk. The risk is lower than the 4%, so the person comes back in a year. Um, and this is a summary of what we talked about. The five-year risk is very um, low as well as the immediate risk. And this is uh, the last one, a 40-year-old who presents with a co-test of vanilla and PAP, positive for high-risk HPV other, with a history of treatment for SIN2. This is the person's cervix, has a uh, density to white lesion, um, more central to the SCJ. Of course, it becomes, looks like a more lower-grade lesion in the periphery. That's how it looks with Lugos. There's a leap that's been done. And um, the histology comes back um, treated with SIN2. And so that's the history of the patient. So the patient is 40 years old with a cold test of vanillin pap, positive for high-risk HPV other, with a history of treatment for SIN2. So how many of you guys say a cold test in a year? How many of you guys say coposcopy? How many say coposcopy or treatment? Treatment, okay. Yeah, coposcopy. And it's because of the patient's history of SIN2 plus disease. So now you know anybody was treated for high-grade disease that comes in even though it's a nil and pap, but it's positive for high-risk HPV, that positive high-risk HPV is going to give you a clue. It has a high sensitivity for what? Recurrence of disease. And that's the reason why you want to do your COPO. Okay? And so the summary is patient's immediate risk for SYN3 plus disease is 5.8. You need to do COPO because treatment of high-grade disease is important for immediate and future risk of SYN3 plus disease. And these patients need to be watched for many years to come. So I'd like to thank um, ASCCP, everyone who voted on these guidelines, the Kaiser Permanente team, the NCI statistical team, um, all the groups that played a part in this and that are still playing a part of this hard work. And I would love to answer any questions that you guys might have. Okay, so. Only 16 and 18 we're paying attention to, not 35, not 45, not 51, 61. My paps come back with like 12 high risk um, reported types. And when I call, the, I get all kinds of answers. And it seems to be LabCorp anyways um, um, protocol to say, well, if we see one type, we're going to tell you all the types we see. Sure. But my worry is, is that we're going to find out five years from now that 45 is very important, 35 is very important, 61 is very important. But oh, and you, and you know what? You're probably right. But I hate, right. And that's why we're doing the HPV extended genotyping. That is why we're doing it. But we need large numbers of patients that have had. So a lot of, this, a lot of the work that's been done with Kaiser, uh, many of them have done genotyping, but it's done for 16 and 18 and they've just kept the other. So what we are trying to do is compile pooling of cohorts where extended genotyping was done so we can identify is the risk in individuals who are HPV 31, HPV 35, any of the other types, especially in minority populations, are they at a higher risk for SIN2 plus disease and should we pay attention to those particular types? You're right. This is something, this is why it's taking so long. We were expected to have the HPV genotyping done this year. And we can't. And I'll tell you this. So we did a study at Grady because guess what we have predominantly at Grady is HPV other. Majority of the patients that come to my co-op clinic are not HPV 16, 18 positive. We do get them, but it's HPV other. And I was so sure, and the resident and my fellow did the study, we said we need to look at everybody presenting with genotyping and look at and determine whether our HPV other has a similar risk of SIN2 plus disease as our 16 and 18. I just wanted to know that within our population. And guess what, and, and we, I, I really thought we were gonna show very close to having um, a risk of SYN2 plus disease at 16 and 18, and we didn't. 16 and 18, 
did have higher um, numbers of SIN2 plus disease was statistically significant in their SIN2 plus disease than our HPV other. But what we did find is that in our population who was HPV other, who smoked, had similar rate of SIN2 plus disease as our 16 and 18, was well, significantly. So, you know, what I wish we were able to do is that we kept all the, all the samples of our HPV other to do extended genotyping, because I really would like to know, is there a subpopulation in that HPV other that, because we pulled them, right? And that kind of may, may have pulled some people down. And so, but we, didn't, we don't have that, unfortunately. So what I'm hoping is all of the pooling of the data that's being done by NCI and ACCP and, and CDC from other studies and from some of the industry studies can kind of answer that question because we are noticing 31 is important and we know that 35 is important in um, um, African descent individuals. So we're taking it seriously and you're right, we don't know. You're absolutely right. Five, I mean, how, how many times have we changed these guidelines? How many times have we done it? So you're absolutely correct. Five years from now, you may be saying, I told them this at a meeting. Yes, we know it, and, and we're just trying to get the data to prove it. Okay, just a second question about vaccination. If you have a patient and their record isn't specific as to which um, Gardasil they got, and they're still having abnormal PAPs, mm -hmm. should you just offer them Gardasil 9? Even though they've had two, but you don't know which two they've had. Yeah, so anybody, I am very liberal with my administration of um, the nanovalent, and so anyone within the age range of the CDC recommendations, which is nine to um, 40, 46 years of age, I will, if they come to my clinic, whether or not they have dysplasia or not of treatment, I offer them the HPV vaccination. As you know, the CDC recommends from 27 to um, 46 to do clinical decisioning. It's up to the physician to do clinical decisioning with their patients to decide whether or not uh, the HPV vaccination would be a benefit. I, to me, clinical decision making means that you actually do have the conversation with your patient and you talk about the pros and cons. And, and it's, not, it's not that stress. So what we did in ASCCP, we came out with a um, guidance in the saying, because a lot of people were asking us, is, you know, we, so, we have some prospective studies that have shown in patients who've been treated with high-grade disease, who have been naive to the HPV vaccine, can we reduce recurrence of disease by giving them the HPV vaccine? So at the current moment, we don't have data to, we have all of these prospective case control studies, but we don't have the randomized trials. The randomized trial is now undergoing in Africa and it's going to go in HIV positive patients. Once we have that data, we'll know whether giving patients naive to the HPV vaccine pre or post treatment would actually reduce their recurrence. Because that's a population you can actually offer, right? That might be important. Um, I sort of feel that um, the risk of giving them the nanovalent versus not giving them the nanovalent, especially um, populations that have a risk of having some of the other types that are in the nanovalent, such as minority populations, I liberally give it to women within that age range. And I understand there's a big push to say that um, the HPV vaccine is getting low, um, underserved populations are not having access to it because countries like ourselves are liberally giving the vaccine out. If I felt that us not giving the vaccine out liberally would actually bring more vaccine to those underserved countries, I'd gladly hold back. But I don't think that's gonna happen with the company, right? So I personally like to protect my patient population and I offer it. And I even, though I'm over 46, because I do so much lasering, because I do so much treatment, and I started, oh, I started getting a you know, sore throat. I don't know, I started, it could have been in my mind, but I said, I feel like I'm getting hoarse. Both me and my fellow said, we're gonna get the HPV vaccine because it's been a recommendation that providers who do a lot of treatment for disease should go ahead and get it so we don't get oropharyngeal, risk for oropharyngeal cancer. So I'm waiting for my third dose. So yeah, I give it. 
Question. With the new recommendation for primary HPV testing, is there a method to determine if your sample is satisfactory? So for example, with cytology, you had a report that said that you got enough cells that it was satisfactory. And we know if it was unsatisfactory that you have to repeat it. We also know that when we do co-testing, even if it's HPV negative, they recommend that you repeat that test in two to four months. Because I guess the theory is if you didn't get enough cells, maybe you didn't get a good enough sample to test for HPV. But when we're doing primary HPV testing, how are we going to determine if our sample is adequate? So the, um, the current HPV tests that are available have a control within them. And that indicates they either had enough DNA or RNA to justify their, their result. Is that the same one that goes on the co-test? Well, that's, let me just tell you this. So, um, for instance, we do co-testing at our institution. It is not the FDA-approved test for primary HPV testing. It is not. And so that's why if anybody has, presumably I talk to our microbiologist, so always speak to your lab core or to the microbiologist with your institution because they're the one that's doing the high-risk HPV testing and indicate and ask them, is the test, the HPV test you're doing have internal controls to make sure that there is sufficient amount of DNA and RNA to justify the answer? Um, and, and that's what I would ask. For our institution, if we have an unsatisfactory cytology, we repeat it again, just to be sure. But that's the reason why. The FDA-approved ones do have internal controls. Right, right. so if, oh, you're saying, oh, no, 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 they should tell you. So for instance, um, the, the, if, for instance, if there wasn't enough DNA, you should get a result that this primary HPV test is not adequate because there wasn't sufficient enough DNA to be able to make a determination of the HPV status. If you're not getting that, you need to, you need to speak to your lab core to see what kind of internal controls they have and make sure they're not cutting corners. Thanks for an excellent lecture. Um, my question is, do you have um, a recommendation of whether or not using the, the brush biopsy is just as effective mm. as the punch biopsy? So um, we've had discussions about the brush biopsy uh, of being you know, less uncomfortable for the patient and determining whether or not there was sufficient amount of tissue present. I, at the present moment, we feel that the data is not conclusive enough to feel that the, the brush biopsy is going to be adequate enough to um, reassure us that we have ruled the patient out for a 2 plus disease. Um, we realize, hopefully, it you know, may get better, but at the present moment, and I know we've had numerous discussions with that group, um, and we just don't feel yet that the date, that it's a, the, the numbers to justify it is enough to make that decision making. I will tell you, um, individuals, if you're concerned about biopsy in the cervix, and typically patients tolerate a biopsy, do baby tischlers. Baby tischlers are, you know, will make it less painful to take your biopsies. But one of the things I started doing, because I also do anoscopy, so I look for anal cancer and anal disease as well. I use a 26 gauge needle, a 25 gauge needle, spinal needle, and I just do like three cc's of lidocaine, and they never really feel that needle going into their cervix, and I inject the, the sites that I'm gonna biopsy, and I biopsy in women that are very hesitant. And so lately it's worked so well that I've been called, you know, uh, the painless copo, coposcopist. Unfortunately, I had all those needles because I was doing anoscopy and then all my colleagues heard that people wanted to see me to do their copos because they weren't getting any pain. And so now they are all using my needles um, and it works really well, it's quick. It, it just takes a few more minutes. But I do it on people that are a little hesitant. Really baby tischlers, you biopsy them real quick, most people tolerate it well. But I do, I have to admit in my, I'm starting to use the little, you know, the 26 gauge, and it's easy. You just inject right there. They never feel it. And they're like, oh, this was the colposcopy. I wasn't worried about it. I know it's lidocaine. I know you got to pay for the lidocaine. You got to pay for those 26 gauge needles. But um, it, it, the patients love it, and, you know, it goes a long way with patient care. 
Thank you, Dr. Flowers. I've got the, the last question, then we'll let everyone get to the beach and the pool for the day. Sure. Um, I just really want to thank you and the work that um, y'all have done with ASCCP because I do find that it has tremendously decreased the amount of referrals. No one wants to see a G1 oncologist ever, yeah. um, and especially not for pre-invasive disease or things leading up to that. So now I get stuck with the patients where the app says use your clinical judgment, which is the group yeah. you were talking about with the postmenopausal, status post-hysterectomy, LCIL, PAP, HPV, other types positive. Right. Which it sounds like, I felt validated that you agonized over that as well. So what is your um, surveillance schedule for those? After your initial colpo, um, how often are you papping them? I, I, I'll, do, I'll do a co-test once a year. You know, just for that one time. And then if they're negative, then they go to every three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And remember, if it's all, only low grade and they've never been treated for high grade disease, then you just follow them for about a 10 year period, as I mentioned to you, and then after that, routine screening, and then when they get to the age of exiting, make sure they have the appropriate exit screening. I also want to kind of highlight to you guys that um, we have a grant for Georgia to look at self collection and multiple ways to try to identify cervical cancer screening in rural and underserved populations. So hopefully, I'll get to see you guys. We'll get to, if you have different. Um, especially when we're more closer to South Georgia, you may hear of us going down there. We really truly want to see if we could do what we did with COVID, teach women just to take a swab of their vagina and send it in and see if they're positive for high-risk HIV to even determine if they need to see a physician. And I think this is the way we need to go to make life easier for women. And actually COVID opened the doors for it. So we're hoping to do that. So if you're wondering, is that the doctor, is, that, is Dr. Flowers having people swab their vagina to see if they, yeah, uh, I'm having people swab their vagina to see if they have cervical disease. So um, thank you very much. And thank you so much. Thank you. So